Third Degree the Podcast is brought to you by Soccer90.com. Explore the Dallas Burn Collection from Mitchell and Ness featuring the new vintage jackets and hoodies. Stuff is fantastic. It's going quick, and they are limited edition, so move fast if you want one. Listeners of Third Degree the Podcast get 20% off on store or online with the code Third Degree. In store online, code Third Degree, soccer90.com. Some exclusions apply. Third Degree the Podcast is also brought to you by the Lindstrom Law Firm for wills, trusts, probates, and business law. Call 469 515 2559. That's 469 515 2559. Or visit lindstromlawfirm.com for a free consultation. Well, hello there, FC Dallas Curious fan. Welcome to another episode of Third Degree, the podcast, number 254. Hi, I'm Peter. Dan Crook is busy doing crook things. So it's just me and your hero, my hero, everybody's hero, editor, founder of thirddegree.net, and the original soccer influencer, Buzz Carrick. Come in, Buzz. Peter, are you saying Dan is a criminal? Is that what you mean by crook things? I it's his it's last law? name. It's his oh. last name. Oh, it'd be okay. like saying it's like doing. He's out doing Carrick things. I thought you were implying he was up to no good. Who me? Yeah, it's a I nefarious. Would never, I would never say that about <laughs> Dan Crook. <laughs> it's not like I would never say that about our Ooh. favorite Mad Hatter. No, yeah. not at all. Yeah. I'm sure you know what he's you know when you say when you were to say something like uh he's out doing crook things in my mind that means he's like a bible study or something like that. Yes. <laughs> or a drag show one or the other. Oh, yeah. Okay, those yeah. are kind of in the same stratosphere to each other. Yeah. Uh yes, Buzz. I was going to start off this particular episode by ob- making an observation. Mm. And that observation is When only three games into the season, the good, smart dean of Dallas soccer journalism, Steve Davis, is already having to write a pair of contrasting articles as to whether or not Dallas fans should be pushing the panic button. I don't think that's necessarily a good sign. No, it's definitely not a good sign, but he's correct. Uh, This thing is teetering on the edge, so it could go either way. And I think the players know it could go either way. So um, it's right now, things are not great. So it sounds like you were about to ask a question there. Well, I was. I I, I think the reason I'm trying to be optimistic because we know MLS is pretty famous for the fact that you can kind of goof off with the first half of the season and get away with a lot because all you really got to do is make the playoffs in this stupid thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, MLS is pretty littered with a lot of teams that ultimately had successful seasons after having a pretty crummy first half of it. And we're not even, even cl- we're not even close to the first quarter of the season being up. So I just wondered if, uh, uh, if, you know, where you, f- if you feel like it is really worth, uh, at all panicking at this point, even if they lose against Vancouver this weekend, uh, it's not worth panicking because you're right. You can rebound and make, uh, the postseason with, you know, with the, with the second half turnaround, but um, there are indeed some uh, some bigger picture sort of structural issues with this team and this roster, and the choices they're making that are um, that are problematic. There's, so there's that's what I mean by it's teetering on the edge. There's there's about five or six questions and ifs and buts around this squad and this team that could break either way, and depending on how many of them break, which way, and whether they could even if they all break. Good. This team could end up being where we thought or hoped that it would be, and if, it, if they all break bad, this team could be trash. So it's uh, you know welcome to MLS parody, but um, at the same time, there are as Steve raised in his articles, there are some outlying things that have us concerned, and some of them we've beat into the ground over the winter, and and we probably will mention them at least in passing, if not in further depth today and going forward as well, but. There are just some things that are not optimal, but MLS, that's always true. Uh, rarely do you have a team that doesn't have some kind of issue somewhere in it, unless you just have a really good GM that phenomenally builds teams like a Garth Lagerway or something, which the team doesn't have. So yeah, there are concerns. So if you were to, if somebody was to ask you, you got to pick one or the other, 
are you pressing the panic button after three games or are you not pressing the panic button after three games? I'm not, pa- I'm not panicking yet. Um, you know, there are, there are several things that can be mitigated that will get better as the team goes forward. Some of them are short-term fixable solutions and some of them are long-term problems that um, you can't really fix without, you know, a, a season to work on them. Um, you know, the, the ones that are short-term and solvable, if they, do become solved that will get this team headed back in the proper direction um, and get it back to where, where we think it was, which was a, you know, bottom half of the playoff picture in the West, I believe is where we all predicted them, you know, fourth through seventh or something like that. So I still think that's true if they can get these things righted. So Dallas heads up to New Jersey last weekend, end up losing at the place they always lose at Red Bull arena which if you haven't been to Red Bull and Rainy, you should go. While it's a house of horrors for the team, it's a fun place to watch a soccer match in this country um, if you haven't made the trip uh, and end up losing that game 2-1. And it did feel pretty inevitable that a bad result was coming. Even, you know, set the set the his, historical records aside, the players that were at Nico's disposal, his insistence on playing this formation, uh, and the combination of those two things seemed to be at great at the at its peak conflict here, Buzz, because we've talked all season about not having enough center backs, and here we are in almost the next to worst case scenario on mm. the back line, where the only healthy starting actual real life center back is Nikosi Tafari. He's got um, uh, uh, Junka on his left, and he's got Emma Tuamasi. That's not even a defender by nature mm-hmm. on his right. What happened to Omar Gonzalez? Uh, he was there on the bench. Why didn't he, he start? Because he's slower than dirt. Well, then why did you buy him? Why did well, you bring him into the roster? Not every team you play is really fast. Some oh. teams are not fast. Mm. Um, New York's strikers are very fast. So they chose to go with Tuomasi, um, who is quicker than Omar. And you know, At a position he's never played before. Yeah, we'll get back to that in a minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Ima had two or three moments that were bad, and um, the team did not do a good enough job of helping him. You know, and, and some of those moments, Ima made mistakes, and, and some of those moments, um, he didn't get enough help. And, and then, um, you know, when, you, when you're – the bottom line is, for me, with Ima, that coach did him dirty, in a sense, of, like, playing a guy at a position he's never played – with hardly any training uh, and a guy who's not fit. He's not game fit. He's only come been back a few weeks. Oh, you know, yeah. he's, he's been, I he was a guy that, that he couldn't even do squat really when he was out. So it's like, he was definitely, it's not that he wasn't even game fit. It's like, he's not even fit fit, you know, let alone game fit. And um, you know, and some of the fans were cheered at him because of what he looks like. And I'm sure he'd be the first to tell you that he's not in shape and, and coach knows it too. And yet coach still oh, did it. So no, you telling me he falls into Buzz's definition of fat. Oh yeah. Oh no. Have you not seen him? Yeah. But you know, I always want to make sure we're, uh, we're being specific in, a, in our name calling and what that yeah. means. Yeah. Yeah. He's, it looks like a guy who sat around for three months and now admittedly too, ema has been hitting the weights pretty hard. So he's bulked up a little bit. I actually think that was the wrong choice on his part, but maybe it's what he could do when he couldn't run. You know, so he's just a little thicker than you're used to seeing. Um, and he got spun a few times and grabbed when he shouldn't have and got a PK. And, you know, and I, I think he was put in an unfair situation. I don't blame him for any of this because he should not have been playing. Hmm. You know, he should not have been playing because coach should have done something different. He should not have been playing because the, the team was built with an inappropriate number of center backs. So, um, you know. I suspect you're going to tell me you talked to Nico today at training or mm-hmm. whenever you saw him, and we'll get to that. But I, I this does continue the very frustrating um, topic of why is he insisting on playing this formation despite the fact that he has to go to New York and play two guys that aren't even natural center backs at center back positions, um, and, and and it and it does. It does. It is weird to me that you're you have a veteran center back that you could put out there, but he's not fast enough, so you end up going with Emma Emma to Amase, who you know it just creates more problems than I think it solves in in some ways, and I, I don't know if it frustrates you as much as it does me. Well, I'm I'm a little frustrated by it, but I'm frustrated more with um, the lack of development of the people that are being asked to play different positions. 
you know, it's it's one thing when you say you have an understanding of I'm putting a younger guy in a position he's never played before and I want to develop him and I want him to get better. But if he continues to not get better and continues to not do it correctly, and, you know, we're talking about some kids that have been doing it since the middle of last year even in training, and you're not seeing it happen, you know, that frustrates me. Um you know, who would be the mo- who would be the best example of that? Oh, Seeley and Bernie. Um, oh, okay. You know, not being wing backs and trying to play wing back. Tuomasi being asked to play center back. I watched Marco Farfan play center back today. Oh you no, know, <laughs> guys that are not in their natural position um, being asked to play other positions. Now you know the hallmark of a modern center back in a lot of ways is your ability to pass out of the back. You know, you got to be able to play this build out sort of game. And some of these guys he's using should give you some ability in that regard, but they're also not basically defensive minded center backs. So, you know, I'm, I'm less concerned about Junka. I, he's played a little center back before. Ima's the one that's like, I don't know what you're thinking. I mean, I know what he was thinking. He was thinking that Ima at that position with Nikosi middle was better than Omar middle and Nikosi right would be, you know, your mileage may vary on that. He may have in hindsight made the wrong choice there, but you know, the, the New York front line is pretty good. So, you know, it, he made a choice and it didn't work. You know, there, there were also big stretches of that game where he would say, and I would agree with him, a lot of parts where Dallas played pretty well and controlled a lot of the game. But, you know, those little mistakes are what makes the difference. How much did the team miss Alara Mendy? Oh, huge. Yeah, massive, massive. Now, Sebastian Legget, I thought, played really well. Uh, he was my man of the match. I thought he, that was a really nice surprise how good and active he was. I mean, he, he looked like that at the end of the last game when he subbed in. It was great to see it for the bulk of that game. Um, I was really pleased with that. Mm-hmm. You know, But when you're talking about two dudes that are in their 30s, you don't want them either one of them to play all 34 games. You're going to have to manage their minutes. And, you know, And so you don't want Yara Mini to have to play every game. You don't want Legette to have to play every game. But when you're missing clearly you know, number one best player in, through the first – three or four spring training games on the first game and you're not missing him, you know, that's obviously going to be, be a big blow. It doesn't matter how old he is when he's your best player, you know, as he has been this year, you're going to hurt. It's going to hurt when he's out. So that, that was, to, that was no surprise that that was the case. You know, last season uh, on this podcast, I made a lot of jokes about how Liam Frazier was like the most anonymous soccer player on da- any Dallas roster ever. Like I couldn't, there was a whole stretch of time after he joined this team where I couldn't remember anything from any of his games. And then he kind of got better as the season went on. And as they got into the playoffs, he, I went, okay, maybe there's something there. He's another one of those guys uh, who I, I, I'm curious as to what you think his, his performance status is so far this season. Well, I thought game one was pretty good, but the set, the next two he's dropped off. So when he loses Yara Mindy in there, he, I think tries to overcompensate and he's been, he's actually been poor defensively, strangely enough, the last two, um, I thought. So not ideal, you know, not, not, not as good as when he's at his peak, mm-hmm. not horrible, but not, not outstanding either. Uh, you know, the 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 the, the drop off the little bit of worse play there when our I, I mean, is out is, is perhaps not surprising because he's trying to overcompensate you know he's doing some nice things in terms of progressive passing and getting forward but he's getting caught out of position and maybe it's because Legette's not as disciplined with his positioning and so therefore Frazier's trying to compensate because that that player over there is more of a pure eight linking eight than Yarmendi who wants to play really deep anyway and sort of occupies that space even when he's passing and building out. So I think that Frazier at best is going to just be a good, serviceable, solid roster piece that you can start. If, if he has to start 34 games, that's a problem. But if he starts 15 games, I'm okay with that. You know, you, in the mix is fine with him. You know, it's, it'll depend on, I think, um, availability of other players and, and matchups who you're going with. Like if you want a game with a little more bite in there, a little more intensity, he might be the choice. Whereas if you want a game where the ball's going to be moving a lot and no one's really going to be hitting hard, you might go with guys that are more – like a double passing kind of look where you had Yarmindy and Legette next to each other together, which would be crazy. But, you know, he's just a valuable piece. You know, not not a star piece like Sam Junka, a guy mm-hmm. you can use and when you need to. Not going to light anybody on fire. You've also been uh, pretty uh, uh, object to the idea of playing Paul Ariel as a, a wingback. 
uh, f- for what I think is a very good pair of reasons. But he did play there against New York, and I have this running feeling that that's kind of where he's going to end up being asked to play, whether we like it or not. And I'm wondering how you felt about his performance on Saturday. I thought it was pretty good. This was the best game yet in terms of defensive positioning of the wing backs. Dante Sealy is very, very slowly getting better at that. He's still just jogging around the field, which isn't helping, but his positioning is better. Paul obviously has played there before and knows how to do it and is a smart soccer player, even if he's losing a step. But yeah, the, this defensive adaptation may be just where he's, he is in his career now, playing more of a defensive role. Um, my, my objection, of course, is, the, is, having, is if they're forced to use him there every game, 90 minutes, week after week after week, you will burn him out. He is you know, approaching 30 you know, you'll, he'll end up looking like Farfan does at the end of the season where they've just played him too much. Mm-hmm. So that would be my worry with him in that spot. If I only have one or two games to win, yeah, of course you play him there. If you're talking playoffs, yeah, of course you do. But, you know, when you're trying to grind through, you know, cups and other things and deep schedules and crazy heat, it's like you need to have other people that can do it. You can't just be like, oh, Paul, solve it. That, that's not going to work, you know. It would be like – Remember Grana when Grana came here and played the first half of the year, he looked great. The back half of the year, he looked horrible because he burned yeah. out. You know, oh yeah, yeah, same yeah. thing. You know, that, like you cannot, especially wing back man, up and down and up and down. I mean, it's like if you're not 18 and in superstar shape, you just cannot do that around here and that length. And that's my concern with Paul. One game on paper, absolutely, he's the right choice. And you saw in this game that he was the right choice. Even he, had, he hadn't done it all spring. He didn't do it a single time that I know of. They were just I just go do it, and he was fine. So I'm sure it would be better if he keeps doing it. You know, he wasn't the problem by any stretch in this game. You know, he didn't he didn't do enough between him and Nikosi. Perhaps they could have done a little more to help Ima Tuomasi, maybe. But, you know, Ima got isolated. It was pretty clear the first first couple of games, the opposition clearly identified the hole behind the wing backs and played balls into those spaces and ran guys out into those spots. Montreal crushed on that right side, getting in behind the left wing back, you know, whether it was Sealy or, or Bernie. Well, this game, the team, the New York didn't do that. They didn't play into those holes. Instead, they went right at Ima Tum, uh, yeah, Ima Tumasi. They identified mm-hmm. that that was going to be a problem spot, and then they attacked it. And he mostly did well, except for those one or two moments, you know. And again, that's not necessarily his fault per se, you know. I mean, it's Saskia got to do something he doesn't do, right? I mean, yeah. All right. Well, then that takes us to. Uh... The front end of the team, which would be Jesus and his return and Petr Musa. Any reaction or thoughts about that? Yeah, it looks like spring training to me. <laughs> it looks like two guys that just got here, you know, whether one of them just got here or whether one of them has been hurt. You know, it looks like two guys that are trying to figure out the pace of the game, the pace of the play, the speed, the how each other move, how each other like to play and interact. It's just a complete disconnect you know, between those two guys right now. And I, that doesn't worry me because I, I'm confident both those guys can play at a really high level and they'll get it. I mean, if they don't, obviously it's a serious problem, but you would expect that they both will. But it's like it's like watching two guys that are three weeks into this preseason, you know, that are still trying to figure everything out. Jesus got better in the second half and then he ran out of time. He was on a 60-minute restriction because he's he's just coming back from that injury. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not too concerned with – um, this particular game with those two guys because we've seen, seen enough out of Musa to know he looks pretty good, his movement's pretty good, but yet he's still not dialed in with everything the team's doing either. It's not like he doesn't understand the concept. It's just that he's not always on the same page with everybody yet. You know, The instincts are not there. They're reading each other, which way you're going to go, which way I like the ball, that kind of thing. It's just mm-hmm. not there yet. It looks like guys that are just now starting to play together, which is exactly what they are. So it's, it's derailing – their, their offensive opportunities, like the first game, right? They had all those opportunities that came offensively. Well, now Jesus and Musa are in there trying to adapt compared to guys that play together in the spring. And those opportunities dropped off because they're not working together yet, not on the same page yet. I'm going to come back to Jesus and ask you another question here in a second. But yeah. anything else from the 2-1 loss at Red Bull that you'd like to discuss or point out or highlight? Or- I mean, just that it, it, you know, it looks like a team still trying to find itself. It looks like it's a preseason game from the Dallas perspective. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, there's, there's been there was like multiple guys that were playing their first complete game of the year. You know, that was LeJet's first 90 minutes. That was two, two Amasi's first start. That was, you know, the, only maybe the second time that uh, Frere uh, Frere and, and Musa have been out there together. Paul's playing in a different position. You know, it's just it, it looks like a spring training process for FC Dallas. You know, they look like they're a team that's not ready to start the season. 
except that it's three games into the season. So, it's, yeah. you know, some of that stuff just can't be helped when you have the injuries that you had in the spring. It is a weird deal because it is so early in the season, and I think it does feel ridiculous to have any reason to want to panic while simultaneously <laughs> having a very, very clear foreboding sense that this doesn't look like yeah, it's possibly yeah, yeah. going to get better when when three of your key players in the, the concept of it getting better are all guys that are either coming off of injury in the form of Velasco and uh, hey, and Giovanni Jesus, who I'm, I'm not convinced either one of those dudes are going to be really 100% anytime this season. Nope. And, and the foreboding sense that we're about to get some really awful news about Paxton. Yeah, the, there's a difference between the, the, the structural roster concerns that are big picture and the stuff that's the little stuff. The little stuff like guys that have been hurt and are still trying to get fit, guys that haven't played together much, guys that are maybe using slightly out of position because other dudes are hurt for new formation, growing pains, guys trying to develop the new positions. Those things don't bother me. Those things don't worry me. Those things, if they continue to be horrible, well, it'll be a problem, but you expect them to get better. Then there's the things that are big concerns. Not having enough center backs is a big concern. The age of a couple of very key players, the age of E.R. Mindy, the age of Legette, the age of, well, Paxton in terms of his body, you know, the good age of Ibby, Aga. Well, what about the age of some of these young guys being asked to play positions yeah. on the wing that really require somebody with a bit more experience and, yeah. you know? Yeah. That, part of the issue is that it feels like the roster was built by a technical director that thought they were playing a 4-3-3. And then <laughs> yes. the coach yeah. changed to a 3-4-3. And it's like, yeah. well, crap, dude. I bought you all these players. We were talking about 3-4-3. What happened? 4-3-3, what happened? Um, you know, so like there's a, there's a bit of a disconnect between what the coach wants to play and the players he has available. And you because it's basically soccer, you can't just go buy six players. You got to develop, you got to, you got to work at it, you know? So that's kind of a, so the big picture concerning ones are the, the thinness of the defense. The fact that if pause gets hurt, you're in trouble. If you are, many is missing huge chunks of time. You're in trouble. If Musa and Jesus don't ever get on the same page, if Paul really has lost a step, you know, those big picture disconnects, big picture roster construction problems, those are the things that concern me where I say it's teetering. It could go either way. And, and if the minor and the, the minor problems, a couple of guys on hurt, a couple of guys still getting fit, a couple of guys developing, those will be magnified if because of the big picture things. If they don't go if those small ones don't go away, it all gets worse and worse and worse, and the thing turns steers into the wall. If those little things start to get better and better and better, then those big picture things maybe aren't a big deal and you can get through them because your defense stays healthy, because your your midfielders are consistently rotated enough, you don't burn any of them out. Your wingbacks do develop. Then we feel really good about everything and everything's going back to a positive direction. So, you know, Steve wrote two pieces about it and and I'm of the mind myself where I'm just sort of, I'm, I'm waiting. I don't know which, there's so many questions that could go either way. And they could all go one way or the other, or they could go a myriad of different ways, and it's going to affect how the season goes. And so we just kind of have to wait. You know, it's going to take a bit to figure that out, uh, for the team to figure it out, and for us to figure it out. And it may be that in a month from now we're like, holy crap, this thing's a nightmare. Or maybe then in a month from now we're like, yeah, see, no worries. It's fine. You know, <laughs> we'll find out. I mean, we're kind of stuck waiting, right? Because you can't really do anything about it. We kind of just got to see how it goes. Well, on the bright side, uh, of the three Texas teams, Dallas has the most points. Yeah. It's weird that we're talking about how bad this team is, and it's like they're in the middle of the table. They're still like ninth in the West or something. You know, there's, there's a whole bunch of teams that have lost, that have not won, not won a single game. Yeah. You know, well, so. but here's the deal, and I'm sure everybody else listening has already done this math, but Dallas is so close to being zero wins, zero points, everything. They are literally like three Martin Paz saves and one Dante Seeley added <laughs> time goal away yeah. from being 0-3, which came against arguably one of the worst teams in the league uh, in the opening yeah. game of the season. So, uh, I it, and, uh, you know, and it maybe losing to Red Bull in Montreal is no shame because I think both of those teams are turning out at least this point of the season yeah. to be two of the better teams in the league. So, Well, except one of them was at home, so you would like to have gotten at least a tie there. I mean, you're going to start with three or four at home. And yeah. if you come out of it with only like three or four points, you're not going to be super happy about that. You know, I you know four points over the first four games is not the end of the world. But you know, if you can get this one against Vancouver, it'll obviously really help 
how you feel about everything. You know? Yes. Well, we'll talk about that here in a second. You did go to training today. We're recording this on Wednesday. Um, and I'm interested if you, uh, you know, got into it with the coach at all and gave him a good yelling at, cause that's what uh -huh. I think all the fans want you to do, Buzz. Uh, Did well, you like point and wag your finger at him and go, what yeah. are you doing, Nico? I, I had one of those little, I had a fan and I like wiggled it really quickly, you know, and then like flicked it, <laughs> that and went, whoosh, and flicked it at him and then stacked him on the nose. With. Um, well, what I will tell you is like what I said at the beginning of the podcast, like uh, that the players know, they know there's a, uh, intensity is not the right word. The training is always intense. There was a snappy uh, vocal vibe to training. Nikosi Tafari yelled at everybody the whole time. Um, really? Yeah. Ibiaga yelled at Dante. You know, there was a, um, there's a group of people that are probably what you would consider the leaders at this point that know that things are precarious and were quite expressive of that's crap. You're not, that's not good enough. Multiple times in training, there was an edge to it. Um, they know, they know that the performance haven't been good enough. You know, the, the people that have been around do, the leaders do. So you can tell um, that they are not, that they're concerned that there's like, it's not good enough, you know, and, and, and part of that, my feelings about it could go either way was watching training. I was watching it thinking to myself, holy crap, this team could be horrible. Cause there really are moments where it's like, it's not working. It's not good. Then there are moments where you're like, oh, okay, maybe it'll, maybe it'll be fine. You know, if this, that, this happens, that happens, that happens. And then, you know, it's, it's just chemistry is tough and positivity is tough to maintain when things are going south, you know, and, and there's an edge to it today. And, and um, I think they know that this game is already a big game, even though it's only the fourth game of the year. You know, maybe, maybe I don't have to point it out, but you didn't throw in a third of sometimes you watch it and you go, man, this could be really awesome. <laughs> you, uh, didn't, you yeah. didn't say that right well it could be, it, it needs certain things to break a certain way for it to be awesome you know what i mean like the, it yeah. needs musa and jesus to get on the same page and i watched the training today and they are not on the same page well somebody's got to help them get the ball in the first place yes that is also part of it and you are not being out there is part of that Paxson not being out there is part of that like well, you're putting a whole lot of weight right now on sebastian legette to be able to link because Seeley's not a passer. Seeley's never going to pass to anybody, right? On <laughs> If you're using Paul on the right, he at least will try to cross and pass to somebody. But he's not going to be like, you know, dribbling through the middle, little tiny combinations. He's more of a go at somebody and then drive it in kind of player, right? Mm -hmm. So, like, right now, if you want to go through the middle, you're looking at Legette, and that's pretty much it. I, so. I I remembered what I wanted to ask you about Jesus yeah. because uh, not long prior to us starting to record this, the roster for the Nations League came out, and Jesus is not on it. Yeah. And I just wonder, do you you know him better than I do? Do you think that has a neg you think that'll have a negative effect on him? Like is he gonna get moody or pouty about his situation? Well, let me just say that I don't know him very well. Hey, Seuss is a very standoffish guy. He's not yeah. a chummy guy. He's not a chatty guy. He's not a buddy, buddy guy. He's a lone wolf kind of guy. And that's, you know, you, you, when you see him at out and about, he's never like with his teammates. He might be with other people. He's got friends that are in like gaming stuff. You know, he's not necessarily his crew like, as they he, call it. Yeah. Yeah. If you will, you know, I've seen him show up at stuff like a North Texas games by himself. You know, he, um, He's not a chummy fellow, but that's fine. He, he, Neither was his dad, to be fair. Yeah, to be totally fair. like it, That has nothing to do with how he is as a player. This just means that I don't know him. I, what I do know of him from afar, and like, afar is relative, I would say he's the kind of guy that will be mad that he's been left out and be pissed and like continue to work really hard. I think he's a guy that reacts well to being challenged. You know what I mean? Like He, he talks about wanting to outperform his dad at this club. And he's driven by that. He's driven by people that question him, you know, the question if he's good enough. So I actually think that like being left out will actually be really good for him. I think he knows that he needs a really good season. Now he doesn't, because you have, he's not a 10, uh, sorry, because he's not a nine anymore. He doesn't need an 18 goal season, but he needs a 10 and 12, 10 and 15. He needs to bring up the assists. The problem is, is that Jesus um, is not a, 10 he's not a string puller 
an orchestrator, a director of balls like his dad was, mm -hmm. uh, or his dad was a little bit. He's, he's not like Mauro Diaz. He's like Jason Christ. He's an off striker. So he needs to be played in a system that, and that uses that. So like the four, the three, four, three is a proper thing for him where he's not sitting behind guys trying to dial in these tiny little passes to break them into the box. He's a guy that he's going to be up there closer to the striker, the nine, right. And working these little combinations that way. Now, if you, if you change formations to put him in a shape where all of a sudden he's that being asked to be a real 10, that's going to be a mess in my opinion. You know, he, he really needs like a three, five, two, you know, or maybe a four, four, two four, with him four, and Moose two. up top. Yeah. yeah. But he's not going to get that. So I do think he'll be challenged. I do think that he's not a, um, Jesus is not like Paxton where he's like a thousand miles an hour in training. He does pace himself a little bit more, but he's a, he's a, he's a big game rise to the occasion guy. He's always takes care of himself physically. He's always ready to go, you know, unless he's out, then that's different. But once he's back, he's usually ready. He's always ready to go. Like, I think you could have run him 90 minutes and then you, they basically put a limit on him. So they had to force themselves to take him out because they could have left him in there easily. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, and I know he'll come good because he's Jesus and he's got the right warrior mentality. You know, the question will just be, you know, do the, do the, do he and Musa have this, have the similar soccer instincts where they get dialed in together? Cause if they do, it could be Graziani Christ if they do, but if they don't, it could be, um, you know, Cooper, uh, um, Blas, where it's like, they both are trying to do totally different things, you know? So um, for those listening to the pod that weren't around back in those days, boy, those are two diametrically different pairs of players. Right. I know. <laughs> and uh, yes, Graziani and Christ was absolutely right. the best. It was right. so good. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that's what you're hoping for, that kind of inter interaction. Um, you know, it, it, but it's proofs can be in the pudding. We got to wait, you know, but I'm not worried about cases. Gra Graziani Christ in 2024 would arguably want to be, would be, if you were just to take the same two guys from the night, you know, whatever yeah. years it was they played and stuck them in 2024 in MLS, I still think they'd be a top three duo in the league. Yeah, you'd have to put them in a shape that would work. It would need a two man front system, you know, 442 or 352. Right. Because again, Christ is not a 10, right? He's not a, he's not Mario Diaz. He's not a string puller sitting in midfield, yanking the ball all over the place. That's not Christ. He was an off striker, took advantage of chaos. Hey, so this is the same player. So, you know. Uh, David Ferrer did it to a certain extent with like David, was it Cunningham? That was a similar sort of combo, like high guy underneath yeah, guy. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. So, you know, you could make that analogy, except that Moose is not a Cunningham. He's more of a Graziani. So that's, you know, that's what we're optimistic for. And that's what mm -hmm. we hope it is. And if that happens, the team will be fine because Martin Paz, as long as he's healthy, will hold up and Tafari will hold the defense together enough that if you can, if those two front guys produce, the team will be fine. Okay. So what did, uh, what did coach say when you did the finger wag? <laughs> well, I was going to ask him, you know, where, where he was in terms of frustration and annoyance about, you know, the tactics in the house not coming together. It's not working. But then they spent half the session working a second formation, not just three, four, three. So, um, I asked him more specifically about that. Okay. Well, are you looking at another formation? Are you, is it because you're losing faith and frustration in the three, four, three? And he said, no, it's because of Vancouver. Like there, there's a, they're thinking about running and not running the three, four, three because of the way Vancouver plays. And I don't want to go too deep into what it is because then someone who works for Vancouver can listen to this podcast and know what Dallas is going to do. So I'm not going to go too Sneaky. deep into it. Um, well, I'm trying to, so I want to talk about, it, but I don't want to go too deep yeah. into it. You, know, you don't want to be, be you, you don't want to be one of those media people that get their pass pulled. Yeah, because <laughs> you pissed off the club. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, I don't, I don't know the coaches listening or anything, and I, and I don't even know the other teams listening. But I don't want to go too deep into what, why they're going to do. I'll, I'll talk about it more, like when we get to the weekend. You know, in my in my preview, or even as the game happens, I'll try and talk about it. But um, depending on which way the team actually goes, because obviously it's under consideration. But um, it's not the four three three. I'll say that. It's a it's a three four three or something else, but, um, you know that that raised the question of like, okay, where's your level of frustration? You know, I see you trying this other thing, and then he said that the other things about Vancouver. Okay, so really, where are you with this? How's it going? And he talked about a lot of the things that I, we've talked about in this podcast so far, like the guys that aren't, you know, have missing guys that have been injured, guys that have been. Um, that are just now almost in preseason form, young players that are not adapting as quickly as he had hoped for the, the position, you know, trying to make do with what he has at certain positions, clearly talking about center back, 
you know, um, key players that are being out. So he's he's frustrated by all those things. I, I think that he does not want to give up on the 4-3-3. I specifically asked him, so that's still the plan. He's like, yeah, I still think that that's the best formation that will help us the most over the course of this season. So he still believes in it. He still is going to be working towards it. Just don't be – if you see something else this weekend, don't take it as a sign he's given up. Take it as a sign that this is a coach that from time to time would change formations. If you think about the last two seasons, from time to time, he would roll out something other than 4-3-3. And this might be one of those occasions this weekend. Well, it would uh, it would make me feel a lot better to see him adjust his team. Look, I, I you know, Buzz, we've talked about this a lot. In, in a perfect world – Dallas would be a club with a manager who said, this is my system. We're so good at it. We're sticking to it. You have to change for us. Yes. Right. You and I are big yeah. believers in that, but that's not what this team is capable of. And so what I was worried about next is that he would be that coach, despite the fact that the system wasn't working and he didn't have the players <laughs> to accommodate it. So in a very weird twist of fate, I'm kind of relieved to hear that maybe he's open to the idea that he may have to adjust the team. Yeah. Uh, to account for who they're playing and account for what he's got available to him. Yes, yeah. Oh, he definitely is a guy that changes it, tactics and even the shape from game to game to game within a context of what he would prefer to do overall. My, I was just talking about somebody about this today. Um, I have always said that the U.S. national team coach doesn't need to be an American, but they need to be a person that's been in North America for a long enough time that they understand the system and the kind of players that we produce and what we're about. Uh, and I also feel that's true of Major League Soccer. I have always felt it's important to know this league and know the kinds of players you have. The guys that have come in from a complete raw foreign background with no idea about the American and the American system, I think have not traditionally done well here. Like up until Tazo Martinez won the world, the, the MLS Cup with Atlanta, like no like foreign coach other than um, Rongen, who had been here for 20 years at that point, has won – MLS Cup, right? It's always guys that know the system. And so part of that for me is one, understanding how to build teams here, how to build the teams with the funny rules, but also understanding that you can't just go get guys when you need them. You have to look at your team, I think. And Dave Durr was really good at this, for example. Every year he'd sit down, he'd look at his team. What do I have? What can I play that puts these guys I have in the best position to win? And I don't think, and this, the and reason I'm telling this story is because I think if you look at what Nico's doing, Nico's trying to fit the roster he has into a formation that he thinks will be really good to take on the league, to take on the teams in the league, where I think you should, as an MLS coach, particularly one that doesn't have a crazy amount of money to spend, you know, that you should be like, here's my roster that they've given me. Okay, how do I optimize this set of players? What should I play? And so if you remember, you would remember, of course, Dave, that Dave Durr would play one year it was a three five two. The next year it was a four four two. The next year it was three five two again. And then it was, you know, he would every year the base system would change based on who he had and what kind of players he had. Nico doesn't do that, and so I worry about that a bit. That he's he's as everyone's been saying, he's square pegging round holes. You know. Yeah, and see, here's the thing, because this actually, um, it's funny you brought up Dave Durr because I was thinking about this the other day, and it brought up a memory uh, of Dave. You know, when I read in your Discord and I see people on different social media use exactly that phrase, square pegs, round holes, in yeah. relations to Nico trying to force this system on this particular roster. And I do feel like we all are looking at this situation, scratching our head going, why is he doing this? This makes no sense. And I, that made me think back, what was the name of the little restaurant in Fair Park that we all used to go to after the games outside the Cotton Bowl? Oh, where, the... The, the, the old mill. Or yeah, old it? mill. It was a water mill kind of looking thing. Yeah, yeah. and yeah. you would go in there, and on and not uncommonly, if you hung around long enough, Dave Durr would show up. And it wasn't uncommon that Dave might have a beer or two while hanging out at the restaurant with everybody. And I remember going to him one day, frustrated about the team, and I said something to him, and in his very Dave Durr way, and I was frightened at the moment, and now I think it's a very funny. He essentially looked at me and said, I'm paraphrasing, look, kid, I've forgotten more about soccer than you'll ever know. I know what I'm doing. 
just trust me on this one. Uh, and I shut up and I just said, yes, sir, Mr. Durr, and left it at that. And and so I've, I've lived with that for a very long time. You know, these guys go through a lot of coaching licenses, have a ton of experience, and they will always have forgotten more about this sport than I will ever know. So when I see somebody like Nico doing this, there's a part of me that wants to just go, Peter, stop it. He knows what he's doing. He's going to figure this out. He has to because it, there's a reason why this doesn't make sense to you, but it can, makes complete and total sense to him. It does make sense to him. Um, I, I, you might be selling yourself short there a little bit on that, by the way. Um, you know, Dave, <laughs> I'll tell you a real quick Dave's story, funny, funny story with me. When, when I first started going out to training, one of the first times I ever talked to him after training, I kind of walked over. There was no PR people in these days at the at practice. And I walked over towards training and he kind of saw me and kind of walked over. Did you over. fall in a hole out by, out yeah, by I the heard, trailer? Yeah, tore up my hip. <laughs> uh, I was like, I was watching the training and I was like, so three, five, two this weekend, obviously. And he's like, man, you know better than to ask that. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> okay, you're right. I won't. I mean, I can see it clear as day, but I'm not going to. Right. Uh, you know, um, well, you remember, Peter, we talked about, the, we made the, the sort of tongue in cheek argument that like when Lucci got hired, it's like I was more qualified than Lucci because I've been going to training for 30 years and he'd only been there for like two or three years, you know, out of, out of being a player, <laughs> his academy coach, right? It's like, it's not really true because he has licenses and I don't, but it's like, that's the idea. It's like, you don't sell yourself short. The coaches these days have all got 15 years less experience than you. You know, Nico's, this is his first job. So, you know, it is fair to question that sometimes. And I, and I, that this is my big question with Eagle right now is this idea that, like, he's convinced that this formation is the right way to go and it's the right way to attack the league. And he might be right, but that doesn't mean he has the players for it and he's trying yeah. to make the players for it. And that, so that's a concern. You know, it's like it may be the difference between you being really good and just sort of average. Uh, you know, on the other hand, he's a very prep, preparation-heavy coach, lots of planning, lots of minutia, lots of specific – adaptations and tactical shifts for the teams they're playing every game. Every game looks different. The tactics change every game. That's a high ask for players. They don't necessarily have you know, high IQs to get guys to do it, which I think is why he's so reliant on your Mindy legit. Why it's so important that guys like pot Paxson can play when he's healthy, why he's more interested in a 32 year old Ibiaga than he is in a 23 year old Corsa. You know, it's like, it's, you know, it's all part of it. You know, he, he, this ain't, you know, the Premier League. He doesn't have that kind of player, mentally speaking, or physically for that matter. Mm -hmm. So it, it may, you know, he's he's making his own bed. He's earned the right to try this formation. I, again, I was talking to somebody today, and, and, and we were joking about, I do wonder if you went into the technical director's office and they have their hidden board behind the thing, that they close it up so nobody can see it, but this big, huge depth chart on the wall of all the assets they've gone and gotten – what formation is on the wall in the technical director's office? Is it a three, four, three? And we were joking that it probably isn't. It's probably the four, three, three still. And that's sort of the disconnect we see in this roster. And that's the biggest question we wonder about is like, does, you know, at what point does he realize I just don't have the guys for this? You know, do you start making trades for it? Do you start, you know, uh, what do you sacrifice? Yeah, I mean, look, you could get pretty cynical about this because there's a uh, there's a version of this story where you could look at this and you could ask yourself, what's what is Nico's agenda behind playing this particular formation? Is this is this a roster? Is this a a, a resume uh, pattern? Like I went to MLS and instituted this cutting edge modern formation that you know only the biggest and most advanced clubs in the world play or I saw what the MLS Cup winner the previous season was winning with so I decided to institute that into my team and force it upon them you know it, it I and I, that's a really cynical way of losing uh, thinking about it but there's also part of me that thinks it's completely legitimate to wonder what's you know why it is why this is going on well I I feel like from the guy that I know, the coach that I know, the Nico Estevez, that it's not he's not doing it to show off, but he truly believes in watching, talking to, going over and studying, training, and trying to emulate the best teams in the world. He he, he believes in that. 
So yes, he's he's playing partially playing this formation because he sees a lot of the really really good teams using it to affect against certain kinds of opposition. So you know, he, he, part of why he's choosing it is because he thinks a lot of teams in MLS play a certain way, and that this system will let him play against them better uh, mm-hmm. over the course of the season. Like very specifically today, like when I asked him about this ch- this tactical change, he very clearly laid out for me how Vancouver plays and why this tactical change he's doing, he's considering will wor- would in his opinion work against them. Where the holes are going to be, how they shift, what their flow looks like when they go to the offense, what it means for his team in terms of countering that. You know, there's a very very clear idea here in his head. And when you talk to him about it, you're like, yeah, that all makes total sense. I totally buy everything you just told me. You know, the formation that he's looking at is one that I particularly like. So that helps too. Of course, I don't really like a back three because the wing back is so hard to play, Mm -hmm. you know, but I also understand, you know, what he's trying to, he's trying to get this team to play at a very, very high level. And it thinks it'll benefit his team, emulating some of the best teams in the world, trying to be on the cutting edge of tactics, you know, like he's tried to do, uh, the flex position thing. Like there was a game last year where Paxton was playing two positions. He was flexing from, I think it was sort of a right mid into like an attacking mid kind of spot um, in the game. You know, he only did it for one game. And there have been games where one time he would he flipped two players in the central midfield, flipped their position. And I asked him, why the world did you do that for that one game? He said, well, I, it's because the way Paxton strikes the ball, the ball will die behind the right behind the defenders instead of releasing and running towards the keeper. And so that team runs a bigger gap between their center back and their keeper. So he's got all these ideas and you, I applaud the um, attempts to execute them. That's why I say that tactically speaking, like I think he's actually a really good coach. He knows all these high level ideas about the game. You know, my concern is, is that does that, does that match with the t- caliber of player in this league and the caliber of player you have on your team at your disposal? He, he may be too ambitious for what he has. Uh, and that's worries me a little bit. So that's where All we right. are. All uh, right. So uh, going from a, uh, a very cloudy kind of um, uncomfortable conversation about the coach, let's go to the real bummer conversation, which is the injury update report yeah, yeah. brought to you by Soccer 90. Right. So, the, the one we're most concerned about, of course, other than the two long terms, Velasco and, and Giovanni Jesus, which are, of course, still way out. So um, Paxton, uh, there's not a decision yet. He said that in the next day or two, by which I took him to mean Friday, he said they will have a 100 percent verdict and an announced plan for what they're going to do with Paxton. So <laughs> I think that means Friday press release. Yeah. You know, but when you add those things together, in my mind, that says prepare yourself for bad. Because if it was, oh, it's no big deal, he's fine, he would have been out there today jogging around. Coach would have been like, yeah, he's no fine, he'll be back this week. That's not what happened. It was, it was. we're still waiting to get the final verdict. Okay, that makes me terrified. So I'm preparing myself without any real evidence. I'm preparing myself for this to be pretty bad news. So we'll see. The fact that we haven't, he's been out for like a week now and, and all in this process, or a week and a half even, all as part of this process of getting another diagnosis, that's to me, that's an alarm bell. So, I'm, well, I, hope I'm I, I, I think you, I think also it's not unfair for us to communicate to the curious that all of the winds have been blowing that we're about to get bad news. Yeah. And, and by that, it's just word on the street kind of thing is. And, and again, you can't go by that, and I don't want to over report anything, but. At this point, I'm going to be surprised if they come back with anything other than kind of the worst possible news. I'll feel relieved if they say, yeah, he'll be back in three months or something like (laughs) that. Yeah, we're not reporting Jack, but I'm telling you that you and I both are anticipating bad news here. You know, certainly not back next week. So uh, prepare yourself for that. And we can, once we know more, we'll talk more about Taxton, I'm sure. Okay. So here's the good news. Yar Mini will not be around this weekend, but he'll be back after the break. So he's basically all, all but cleared. So, you know, one more game out and he'll be, he'll be good to go after the international break. So this was an injury and not just a pre-planned resting. Yeah. It's something with the abductor, I believe, uh, yeah. you know, something um, I, I, I'm pretty sure this is not a big deal. You know, coach, 
today was very adamant that you no, know, he'll be fine. He's going to sit out this one more, you know, and then there'll be plenty of time to get him ready to go for the game. You know, and, we're going to play two more games. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully more. Than that. Another game and a half or whatever it was. <laughs> yeah, hopefully. I mean, look, the dude's thirty-four, so yes, like you're going to have to mitigate this no matter what. But no concern here. It doesn't sound like. You know, he won't be here for Vancouver, but he'll be here for the game after that. Um, Korcha, Farfan, Ibiaga, all back in training, 100% fine, good to go, available for selection. So you're down to the only people out are, are Velasco and Giovanni Jesus, maybe Paxton, long, those long-term three, possibly, and then Aramini will be back in a week. So uh, that's all actually relatively good news in terms of where we were, you know, a week and a half ago. So... Other than obviously we're, we're terrified about what's going to be the deal with Paxson, but other okay. than that, it's all moving in the right direction and relatively positive. Considering that, like last week, there were like seven players out. You know, Jesus should be past his minute restriction. You know, that should be good to go. Um, really, you have your entire defense is now available to you for the first time this year. You know, plenty of options that way. So, you know, if, if you go three four three, you actually have other people you can use on wing back other than Dante Sealy, for example. So you know, there's choices to be made at any of these positions. Okay. You know, Ima Tumasi doesn't have to play center back again. So that's nice. That would be nice, yes. Yeah. So Vancouver Saturday night come into the game undefeated, but they're also one of only two teams in the West, that, or no, three teams that have only played two games, and that was a win over San Jose and a draw against Charlotte to open the season. Um Okay, let's talk a little bit about Vancouver. They play a three-four-three, so uh, that's a you know the formation that the Dallas. A lot of people in this league are now playing. Um, so if Dallas plays a three-four-three, let's talk about that because that's the formation they've been using all year. Then it becomes very simple, right? Petter Moose is up top, Jesus is up there, probably Bernie with him on and then underneath pair until somebody comes along and outplays Bernie in that position. It'll be Bernie, even though he's only been kind of like a top spinning around with no idea what to do. <laughs> Dante Celia at left wing back, possible Marco Farfan there. So that spot is in contention for choice. I don't know if Marco will walk in and take that job away, but potentially possible. Um, Legette, after Legette's game, I think he's a lock. The position next to him in the double pivot will either be Delgado or Frazier, and I think there's a legit chance it's Delgado. I think he's played really well. Patrickson, as you might, as you like to call him. Uh, he's legit. I think there's a legit chance. That's the name chance. on his shirt, by the way. Yeah. He, he, that's like, well, his name is Patrickson because he's, he's the son of Patrick, you know, and apparently that's actually is really true. And he, he, I think he likes it in a Brazilian style, even though like funny enough, if you listen to like the audio clip of him saying his name, they're like, okay, say your name. And he says, Patrickson. And that's it. And you clearly hear them say to him and your last name, and he goes, Oh, Delgado. So yeah. like he wants to be the singular Patrickson. So okay. we'll call him Patrickson. So he, I, I think there's a chance, it, maybe even 60-40, that he's in there with Legette over Frazier because it's a home game. Maybe give him an opportunity. Frazier started three straight, you know, so that's possible. Right wing back will be Paul again. And then your back three is back to the normal um, Junka, Nikosi Tafari, and Ibiaga with Paz behind. So that's your formation if your group, if you go 3-4-3 three, three with really only – Sealy versus Farfan probably is your only. Oh, and then sorry, Patrickson, Frazier. Those are your two spots that are really up for contention. Everything else is pretty set. Now I'm I'm not going to say what the other tactical formation was they used, but you know it'll be based off of some similar personnel. You wouldn't see a radical variation from that personnel. You might see one or two changes to work out different tactics, but I'm I'm not going to go into what they are until we get closer to game time. So, all right, we get but, it. You have. You have ethics and morals. I've just claimed it enough, I think, that I feel comfortable with where we're at. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Okay. Maybe in the Discord we'll get into it because then we, that's a place we won't have spies. Yeah. Plus, you get paid for the Discord. That's, that's um, true. <laughs> uh, incentive to give Buzz five bucks. Um, I also want to make a, a comment that relates back to a discussion we've had multiple times about the new uh, primary kit this season. Have you seen the photo that's floating around? I think it's from the Red Bull game of them uh, kind of walking back up the field and Sealy's back is to the camera with the red part of the jersey, but everybody else on the team is walking forward. Have you seen this photo? No, I don't think so. 
Um, I'll have to send it to you. And the reason, why, and and maybe you can make it the chapter art or something. Yeah, yeah. And I and I I don't know when this photo was taken. I did they wear what shirt did they? Um, I can't remember what they wore in New York. The white one. The white one. Yeah. So white this on isn't white. from that. Yeah. Right. 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 Um. So I don't know when this was taken, but the reason why I'm bringing this up is this this photo captures and epitomizes everything that's driving me nuts about this new kit because the the, the overriding image of all of the players minus Dante Seely whose back is to the camera is that this kit is predominantly navy blue like a dark navy blue and and purple it's not red and and it and it doesn't look like a Dallas shirt yeah that's what we've said all along or a Dallas know, kit like- it would be opening day because that's the only game they've worn that. Oh, jersey. yeah. Maybe that's place. when it's from. It's an yeah. artfully done photo. It's actually a really cool picture. And again, I think the kit unto itself looks good. It just doesn't look like a Dallas kit. And that yeah. keeps dri- that drives me nuts. Totally agree. Yeah. There's a picture of Paul where he's clapping to the audience and it's wearing a purple jersey. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cute purple is not the uh, unofficial color of Dallas. I mean, maybe it is, and I just don't know. Well, I'm looking forward to this weekend. This is a big weekend for me because my uh, our friend Lars Siverston is in town. He's officially here. Uh, we took him to go get Cadillac barbecue today, oh, by the way. Never taken me to get Cadillac barbecue. Uh, but here's the deal. So we're doing our live show on Saturday out at Soccer Spectrum from New to 4. All the curious are welcome to come meet Lars in person. Buzz is going to be there to do a Dallas segment, so you get to hang out yeah. and see Buzz and eat pizza and drink beer. And then uh, Lars, myself, Buzz, and the good Amy – are all going to the Dallas game together, hand in hand, as a as a as a, a foursome. If people don't know who Amy is, that's my wife. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> I don't usually say her name so much. Snake, as I call. It's Buzz's yeah. Tinder date. My better half. Yes, and yeah. so uh, and so we're all getting to go sit in good seats at the game. So yeah, yeah. I'm looking forward to this. This will be a lot of fun. Hopefully, yeah. the team will play well and get a win. I've never met Lars. That'll be fun. Well, I only just met him. Uh, less than 24 hours ago for the first time in person, despite the fact that he and I have been conversing and everything. I went back and looked at the very first time I traded a communication with him. It's, it was October of 2019. Wow. And the tie is FC Dallas related. It was because I was listening to a podcast he was on, and he made a reference to the fact that Andresnik had gotten a call up to the Czech national team because of his good play for FC Dallas wow. and MLS. Right. And I sent him a note and said, it's funny you mentioned this because the guy has had a giant bag of nothing all season until this very late run where he actually started coming good and good enough that he got an international call-up. And that is what struck up the friendship between he and I. And it went on from there. So There you go. FC Dallas bringing people together. Yes. For, for <laughs> 29 years. <laughs> making lifelong friends all over the world. Yeah, I've known you half my life because of this stupid club. I know. It's great. It is fantastic. So uh, if you're out at the stadium and you see us, please come over and say hello. Introduce yourself if we have never met or if we have met, come say hello. Uh, Don't ever be afraid to come say howdy to everybody on the crew. Buzz, I miss Dan today, and I feel very bad for him because I don't know if you're aware of while we were recording this, Luton was up mm. 3 nothing at halftime and blew it, lost to Bournemouth 4-3. to three. Well, I believe they're going with the highly coveted, brand new, cutting-edge tactical concept of playing three center backs without having three center backs. I believe that's their <laughs> taking a page out of the FC Dallas playbook. <laughs> <laughs> Luton is so it's working well for them uh, as well. Oh no, they lost four three. But Tyler Adams got on the field today. He came on in the seventy oh, first minute. So that's good. But if we're looking for any kind of sunshine, I know Dan will not consider that. I will at least say, uh, I know you. Many of us are Hatters fans and rooting for them. And to blow a three goal lead, oh no, is a bad thing. At least we saw Tyler Adams back on the field. So there you go. Yeah. All right, Buzz, uh, look forward to uh, Saturday and uh, seeing you and Amy and hanging out at the game. Buzz. Yeah, and I know you won't care, but one tiny thing is that North Texas Soccer Club starts play on Friday, and I'll be out there so people can come say hello, as long as they don't hang out the whole game, because I do want to okay. watch it. But uh, if you care about the, the you know the deeper dive into this team and its future, then you want to watch North Texas Soccer Club play soccer. So 
That's important. Okay, you keep telling me that. I know, and you never go. It's just fine. It's, it doesn't <laughs> have to be your jam, <laughs> but it's my jam. I love it. So it's, I get it. Hey, yeah. look, if they end up building a stadium over there at Hobby Park uh, for a women's team at some point, I, you know what? I'll probably buy season tickets and go to those things on the regular because yeah. it's five minutes from my house. Is that thing? That's the thing in Garland. Yeah. Yeah, that that's died. It. Oh, did it? Yeah, I thought it was. Oh, yeah, it's no. Yeah, one of the. Um, Investors turn out to have an issue, and I don't want to speak out of turn because I don't want to get in trouble. But um, that fell apart. That's dead. Oh, that sucked because yeah. I thought that was a really cool idea to use that giant piece of land for something like that. That would have been a really, really cool. Well, there still is a women's team coming. Yes, we just I saw know that. This is a. I don't know if that was them or whether they're going to play somewhere else. I have no idea, but that's happening. The team in Texoma is coming. If you're up in that neck of the woods, I'm going to. Boy, way up there driving to frisco is a pain in the ass oh man i went to their brand thing it took me forever to get there yeah um the obviously north texas is building a stadium down in mansfield which is worse for me but whatever um the, somebody still owns the um donnie nelson you know austin bold usl championship rights are still floating around there somewhere around town as far as i know dan donnie keeps paying the fee to keep those things renewing, which is not a small piece of money, by the way. I think he's crazy at this point, but he's still doing it. Mm. So we'll see. There's there's still developing properties in and around Dallas in terms of soccer. And also, of course, Dallas Cup is next starts next weekend. Not this weekend, but next weekend. So, mm. Mm -mm -mm. so get hyped for that because that'll be fun. All right, Buzz. See you on Saturday, my friend. Yeah, looking forward to it. It'll be fun. Yep. The Third Grade Podcast has been brought to you by Soccer90.com. Make sure to explore the brand new Dallas Burn collection from Mitchell and Ness. It's fantastic stuff. Vintage hoodies, tees, jackets. We're going fast, limited stock. So if you want one, you better move quick. Uh, remember that as a listener of this podcast, you get 20% off with code Third Degree at checkout, both in store and online. Code Third Degree, 20% off. Soccer90.com. Some exclusions may apply. Third Degree, the podcast has also been brought to you by the Lindstrom Law Firm for wills, trusts, probates, and business law. Call 469-515-2559, 469-515-2559, or visit the lindstromlawfirm.com for a free consultation. Thank you, and thank you to the very faithful FC Dallas Curious fan. We will speak to you next week. Oh, by the way, maybe Lars will participate in the next episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Wow, what? Lars has, Lars has asked oh. if he could participate in next week's episode because he will have attended the game and okay. would love to express his uh, uh, express his experience okay. and talk about what he saw. Sure. Would you like I, that? Yeah, glad we talked about that in advance. Oh, well, you, <laughs> you can edit it out. Uh, sure, it'll be fine. Let's do it. All right. We will talk to you guys next week one way or the other on another episode of Third Degree, the podcast. Get well, Paxton. Third Degree. The third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast.